This is an emergency podcast from the National Secular Society about the plight of Mubarak Bala, the president of the Humanist Association of Nigeria. Bala was arrested in Kaduna, northern Nigeria, by the police on the 28th of April, acting on a petition which accused him of blasphemy against Islam. Since then, he appears to have been transferred to Kano State, which is governed by Sharia law, and where the penalty for blasphemy is potentially death. I spoke to Leo Igwe in Iba, southwestern Nigeria, to find out what has happened to Bala and what can be done to help him. Leo Igwe is the founder of the Humanist Association of Nigeria and a human rights advocate. Mubarak Bala's plight should be a matter of urgent interest not only to humanists and secularists, but to everyone around the world who supports freedom of speech and freedom of conscience. As this podcast has been done at short notice, we apologise if the quality is not as high as usual. A full transcript of the interview, conducted by Emma Park, is available on our website. I'm joined now by Leo Igwe, who's in Iba, um, in the southwest of Nigeria. And Leo is the founder of the Humanist Association of Nigeria. Um, Leo, hello. Yeah, hello. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? I'm great. (laughs) Good. Um, Now, Mubarak Bala. he was arrested on the 28th of April in, in Kaduna. Um, is he still in Kaduna or has, do you know where he is now? Well, actually, I don't know. We don't know where he is at the moment. But um, what we know is that uh, he was arrested in Kaduna. And uh, when I rang up the police commissioner in Kaduna, he said, yes, that they got some directives from Kano, which is a neighboring state to arrest and detain uh, Mubarak. Yeah, so, and um, uh, they did that. And the following day, uh, I was told that uh, they transferred him to Kano. And that was the last we heard. We've been trying to get um, get them to allow Mubarak to see a lawyer. Nobody has, they have not allowed Mubarak to see any lawyer or to get to know what they charge, if any, is. So, yeah, that's where we are. We just don't know exactly where he is at the moment. And and what was the last date which you heard from him on? I heard from him for about 10 seconds the day, the second, the following day after his arrest. Because we sent some of our members to go and see him in Kaduna, uh, the Kaduna Detention Center, and um, they gave him the phone. And as soon as he said, hello, hello, is it Leo? I said, yes. They now snatched the phone from him and they switched it off. So that was the last time we communicated. And what did he sound like on the phone? Well, I think he sounded very anxious because I think he wanted to get get across some information uh, with regard to getting a lawyer and what to do. And I also wanted to find out if he had any idea and what was going on and all that. So he sounded very anxious. Um, Yeah, because... um, uh, and I must say that before this arrest, there had been death threats. He had received death threats. And two days to the arrest, I called him. I said, look, uh, shouldn't we re- re- report to the police? Should we go to the police and report this matter? He told me not to worry, that if we uh, report the matter to the police, that it will escalate the situation. And, you know, he's this kind of very light-minded guy. He said, don't worry, I know what to tell them whenever they issue death threats. I try to tell them something that will make them not to uh, communicate with me again and all that. So um, we saw the, this kind of situation coming, uh, but um, he said that there was no need reporting to the police that it might escalate the problem. Uh, but all the police we wanted to report to eventually came and, and now arrested him and detained him and, held, and are holding him in communicado at the moment. So the very police he wanted to rely on have actually um, arrested him. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, and so what it, it was, I, as far as I understand, he did some Facebook posts. Is that what is behind um, the, the, the arrest? Yes, according to the, the police, because what happens is that why the police officers in Kano have not charged him, I did, I, I made efforts to, un, to try to understand why he was arrested from the police officer. I sent them text messages. I called them on the phone. So the first time I got through to the uh, police officer, the police commissioner in Kano, uh, he told me that, yes, that there was a complaint that he made Facebook posts that insulted Prophet Muhammad. 
And he told me it was a form of blasphemy. And uh, jokingly, I told him I didn't know what blasphemy was because somebody really needs to tell me what is a blasphemy. I don't know what, you know, I told him I didn't know what it was. So he tried to explain it to me. So I think he's in relation to that Facebook post. But I must say that the police have not officially charged him. Under Nigerian law, are the police meant to inform um, Mubarak Bala when, of, of what the charges are against him? Yeah, definitely. They need to charge him because if they don't charge him, they, how, how, can they, how can he begin to defend himself? Because he needs to see a lawyer, he needs to be taken to court, and uh, he needs to defend himself. And for him to defend himself, it is important that he is charged. Of course. And what were the content of his posts that, that caused the problem? When the, the police officer told me that, yes, that uh, Mubarak made a lot of po posted some comments uh, on, on his Facebook page, I told him people post comments and I don't spend my time nosing around trying to know who is posting what. So uh, what happens is that according to the complaint, they said that he posted a comment uh, where he he made statements that implied that um, Prophet Muhammad was a terrorist. I think that was, that was mainly you know, what they were, they were referring to. And they said it was annoying to Muslims. It was provocative to Muslims. Yeah. Is that comment still up on Facebook or has it been removed? Well, I don't know right now. And I don't trust anything about the Facebook now because when they arrested him, they took, um, they seized his laptop and telephone and then... Um, um, much of what they were posting, I heard, they were actually making some posts and trying to keep certain information there just to make sure that they implicate him um, uh, because of the allegation brought against him. So um, I don't, I've not visited his uh, Facebook page now, but I don't trust anything, if anything is there at all. Okay, because I see on the 26th of April, two days before his arrest, there is a Facebook post by, which purports to be by him, which says that, um, he wanted to um, make some um, blasphemous comments, but someone who could twist my arm has asked me to allow it to rest. So I will give it a break. Only mild, milder critic posts and humor. That's what he said on the 26th of April. Um, did, did you come across this at all? Yeah, well, well, I don't. The, the fact there is that um, he reacts to so many situations going on in the North using his own comments. So because comments have contests. Yes. And sometimes when you are of the context, you look at it. You might look at it as maybe something unnecessary, but you may not understand the context. Now, when I, when I spoke to him last on phone, that was about two days before he was arrested, uh, he told me that um, in Kano, they didn't believe in the coronavirus, that people were going about their business thinking that coronavirus was just something invented by Jews to stop Muslims from going to the mosque. And people were washing their hands, drinking the water, and people were playing football. They call it Corona tournament and all that. So he, he's always outraged how people practice Islam in a way that goes against common sense, science, and the agreed basis of human relationship. He's that kind of person. And what he does is that he tries to come up with comments and posts that could make the people to begin to think and rethink. Since he is well experienced, he grew up among these people. He knows comments he could use to make them to rethink their positions that he feels are very much embarrassing. And let me tell you this. He told me also during our conversation that the understanding is that this world is like a social prison. And that if an epidemic could actually free you from this, this thing, it's okay. So even when they die as an epidemic, they are going to die as a matter. Now tell me what else could be more in violation of WHO guidelines for people taking care of themselves at this time than such positions. So this is, they rile him up. He gets angry, yes, and he reacts at, on that basis. I see. And, and Leo, who is likely to be behind um, the, this um, arrest of Mubarak Bala? Who do you think the people are who would like to, likely to have caused it? Well, formally, Formally, we know that it is one S.S. Umar. That's the person that wrote a petition that sent to the police. And the police, they have uh, the right, when they look at a petition, to accept you know, it and look at it and take action based on that petition. Okay? But I am not sure that S.S. Umar is acting alone. Okay? 
There are others. <laughs> who is S.S. Tumor? Do you know who he is? He's a lawyer based in Kano, and he is the one that wrote the petition. That is the petition to the police. Okay? And that's what we are holding on to as of now. If there are other petitions, we don't know because the police has not come out formally to tell us exactly what is going on. Yeah. So, so that is, the, but I understand that there are other interest groups. So, SSUMAR is just only fronting for various interest groups that want Mubarak silent or sanctions as a result of his posts. And, and who are these interest groups? Yeah, these are interest groups that feel that people should not speak freely about Mohammed and Islam. These are interest groups that think that they are the clearing house when it comes to what you say or not say about Islam and Prophet Muhammad. These are interest groups that sometimes threaten violence or do you, uh, use violence to silence any real or imagined critic of Islam. You see, these groups, sometimes they come out in various ways and names. Sometimes they are clerics with followerships. They are mosques, you know, because each mosque, you have clerics attached to it, okay? So these are people who have followers and who think that they are the clearing house when it comes to what you have to say or not say about Prophet Muhammad or Islam. So they don't want the other. And the other could be critical. The other could be maybe caricatural, depending on what you mean or how you want to say it. So these, these are the people that sometimes threaten chaos, that they will make a place ungovernable if nothing is done to silence people who say things critical, they think that, uh, that are critical of, of uh, Mohammed and Islam. And how, how widespread are these types of groups in the Muslim parts of Nigeria and in the northern Nigerian states? How, how, difficult, how easy or difficult is it for people who are atheists or, or not um, Muslims to criticize Islam in, in those parts of Nigeria? Well, it is, not, it is not like how difficult it is. The thing there is that it is, it is seen as unthinkable, it's a taboo. Look, because if you are born into a Muslim family, the idea is that you are a, a Muslim for life. So to leave Islam is a crime under Sharia law. That's apostasy. So one of the things hurting some of the people who are rallying against Mubarak is that Mubarak renounced Islam. Now, it's painful enough to these people. Now, he, he goes on now to highlight some of the gaps and the, uh, some of the issues in Islam that he, he did not agree with and he does not agree with. So these are, these are things that are really angering and annoying many people out there. So how many are there and how, how pervasive, how strong are they? In these mosques, we have different clerics with different ideologies. Like since he was arrested, we have had this cleric that has come, they have come out, that has come out denouncing Mubarak and denouncing all those like Amnesty International and, on, and others who are trying to rally support for Mubarak. So there are as many as we have clerics in this region who are against uh, criticism of Islam or who think that they are the clearing house in terms of what should be said and not said about Islam. Now, this is also not the first time that um, Mubarak has been um, put under arrest um, for his beliefs, is it? Because um, in 2014, he was confined to a psychiatric ward um, by his own family for, for renouncing Islam. Yes, yes. Actually, yes, in 2014, um, he was taken to a mental hospital because when he started speaking out, expressing his views, letting the family know where he stand with regard to the teachings of Islam, they thought he was mad. Something must be wrong with him. And they now took him to mental hospital. So, and he was lucky. There was a strike. There was industrial action. So the workers were not coming. At that point, he left the hospital. And since then, he has been speaking out openly. And that has not been going down well with many segments of the population. And they, in fact, they have been thinking that he has been encouraging more people to come out openly to say that they are atheists. Because part of what we are seeing today is not just the arrest of Mubarak 
But also, they are profiling FEs that are trying to track the FEs network in the region and to understand you know, the, all those who are associated with Mubarak when it comes to his position and those who are encouraging him. According to the commissioner of police, when I called him, he said, are you one of those who are encouraging him to make the posts he, he, he was making? So, so this is all an effort to silence, silence him and silence all those who may be associated with him. So are, are the police in Kano then um, applying Sharia law? Well, we need, first of all, they need to charge him first, and we need to know where they're going to charge him. So at the moment, he has not been formally charged. All these are depending on uh, speculation based on the complaint we saw, a copy of the complaint we saw, and my personal discussion with the commissioner of police in Kano and the police public relations officer in Kano. So there has not been any formal charge until they come out and charge him. We now know whether they will charge him in a Sharia court or charge him in, a, in, a, in a, what we call the state court. So, so we still don't know. The, it's still not clear, you know, where and how he's going to be charged. Do you have any idea when, when you might know? Um, it's difficult because um, a matter like this is a bit complex and sensitive. Number one there is that it will be difficult for um, Mubarak to be charged because there's a risk that Islamic mob could go there and burn down the place if they are not satisfied with the charge and the place is made. Because as, as Mubarak stands now, the mobs in, in Kano, they have already condemned him. If at the end of the day, he's being prosecuted in a way that doesn't resonate with the, with the, with the, with the wishes of the mob, they could overrun any place that they, 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 they are trying to prosecute him and maybe burn it down and kill him. So actually bringing him out in public and charging him is going to be a problem. Now, another way is to charge him secretly. Now, you, you charge and prosecute him secretly. That will not be fair. It will not be fair to Mubarak, and it will, it will not be fair to anyone in terms of trying to get justice for him. So I think that is going to be a huge challenge, uh, charging and prosecuting Mubarak. What solution would you like to see? Well, <laughs> um, well <laughs> this is a very interesting question, I must say. The solution should be compatible with the safety human rights and dignified treatment of Mubarak. The, the solution should be one that does not, a solution that is not dictated by the Islamic mob. No, it should be actually, if you ask me, one that is in defiance of the mob. Yes, because the mob, they want him killed. They want him silent forever. They want him neutralized. They want him uh, and all associated with him clamped down and silent. Somebody has described atheism as a cancer that has to be taken away from northern Nigeria. Somebody has threatened that if they don't give him adequate punishment, if he comes out, they will kill him. They even threatened to invade the prison where he's, where, whatever he's kept, if they know the place, and kill him. So, so in, with this kind of situation, the way forward is an arrangement that gets him out of Kano, and takes him to a place of safety, while at the end of the day, the police will continue to do their work in compatible with the laws and the constitution of Nigeria and international human rights mechanisms. Now, now blasphemy is, is a crime in, um, under Sharia law, but is it a crime throughout the whole of Nigeria? Yeah, we have, we have sections, because I'm not a legal person, so I'm always very slow talking about laws and all that. We have a section that said that People should not um, uh, say things that really disrespect other people's religion, okay? But the question there is, that what is that? Who determines what that is? Is it an Islamic uh, court determining that when, when the defendant is a Christian? Or is it a Christian judge determining that when the defendant is a Muslim? You see, some of these things, they lie there in our criminal or penal code, but they are just vague and ambiguous. So that it is a fact when you say something is um, uh, disrespectful of people's religion. I want to tell you that if we must prosecute and jail those who say that, everybody will be in jail. I want to tell you because of the prevalence of religion and the way people freely talk about religion. Islamic clerics will be in jail because most of them try by condemning other religions. and other. I, I, I'm telling you that right now that clerics have come out to heal, to uh, kind of um, um, 
to condemn uh, all those who are supporting Mubarak and to mobilize their support their supporters you know to threaten those people intimidate them and all that and if we if if we really have laws that effective laws that condemn that many of the clerics will be in jail the pastors and all that because that is how religion thrives in Nigeria by condemning each other so what i'm saying there is that let's say that there are blasphemy laws the question is this how do we enforce it and how do we interpret it and what actually constitutes blasphemy so yeah, what you're saying is that it's fine for, for Christian or Muslim clerics to insult other religions, but if you're an atheist, you're sort of stuck between two different camps. Yes, in Nigeria, for them it is, well, I, I won't say that it is, for them it is fine for them to say it, because here it depends on, if you say it, where are you? If you are, if you're a Christian and you find yourself in the Muslim majority sections of the country, you are in trouble, Okay. Good. And, and I must say that all the blasphemy issues that I know, to the best of my knowledge, are usually Christians saying something critical of Islamic uh, teachings or, or, or Islamic prophet. I have not had any blasphemy cases in the southern part that's Christian-dominated, where people said something critical of, uh, of, uh, of, of Christianity and all that. Like now, what did they say? They said that, okay, uh, Mubarak called uh, Prophet Muhammad a terrorist. Now, I want to tell you, if I call Jesus a terrorist, nobody will do anything. Nobody. Somebody will just look at you with a kind of eye and get away. And will tell you, yeah, you are going to hell or something. And make a, a kind of a very casual remark. And that ends it. But we have in Nigeria an insecure Islam. The, pra the, the practice and Islam that is so insecure that immediately you say anything critical of it, they get worked up. And the next thing, they want to kill you. And... Is there anything that your organization, the, the Humanist Association of Nigeria or other international organizations can do to help Mubarak at this point? Well, what we are trying to do is at the, at the Humanist Association, in conjunction with um, the Humanist International, uh, the Atheist Alliance International, International Association of Atheists and Agnostics, and um, a couple of other organizations, what we are trying to do at the moment is, first of all, to rally support for the defense of Mubarak, yes. And, um, and there is a defense fund, uh, uh, Women's International is coordinating it. We have hired three lawyers, because at the moment, we have a lockdown in Nigeria. So the people, there, is, there is a prohibition of interstate travels. And they have moved him from uh, Kaduna to, um, to Kano. So we have to be hiring lawyers as they are moving him around. Like now, we understand he should be somewhere in Kano, we have a lawyer on a standby in Kano. We, we are to contract a lawyer in, um, in Kaduna, but the next thing we had that they had moved him from Kaduna. Then they needed to file some, um, some petition in Abuja. So we also uh, hired a lawyer to do that in Abuja. So we've been you know, trying to uh, provide a kind of a robust defense for him. Um, Why we also try to appeal to the diplomatic community to figure out a way to reach to Nigerian authorities put pressure on them because we want to know where is he. Because look, before he was arrested, Mubarak received death threats from police officers. Mubarak received death threats from soldiers. A soldier in Maiduguri threatened to kill him if he sees him. Um, a, a police officer was one of, among those who, sent, who, who issued death threats uh, against Mubarak shortly before he was arrested. Now, how do you think that we are going to feel safe when he is now in custody of, uh, of custody of the police or security officers, some of whom are of the view that he should be killed. So that is it. So holding him, we are worried. We don't know whether he is alive or dead. We don't know whether they are torturing and beating him every day. And there's a need for the Nigerian authorities to establish communication with us. Let us know what is happening to him. Let us know the state of his detention. Let us know whether, whether, whether he's tortured. Because if we don't know this, then they'll be sending a wrong signal, you know, not just to the humanist movement and the minority non-religious organizations. They'll be sending a wrong signal to the whole international community that Nigeria is a place where people can just be detained anyhow without, uh, without access to a lawyer, without access to understanding, you know, some of the basic conditions under which the person is detained. Is that sort of thing, does that happen in Nigeria a lot, that people are detained without access to a lawyer? And, um, it, ha it happens sometimes. It happens sometimes. But pressure 
from local and international pressure sometimes will make them at a point to yield. So, but we hope it will apply in this time, and that is what we want. But at the moment, we have not we have not seen any any signal, but we hope that will apply, and that very soon we'll be, uh, Mubarak will be able to have access to his lawyer and we'll be able to know where he's detained and how he's detained. Okay, great. Thank you, Leo. Just one final question. You mentioned the possibility of torture. Is, is that a likely risk that he might get tortured while he's in custody in Kano? Yes, it is very, very likely that he's going to be tortured because they, let me tell you from why I said so. I spoke to the commissioner of police in Kano before he arrived, because as soon as I heard that they had moved him from Kaduna, that's a distance to Kano, I started calling Kano police officers. And I spoke with the commissioner of police. And when I told him, yes, I was calling in respect of Mubarak and all that, he was very upset. He said that, did I know what the guy did? And that he's been posting uh, blasphemous uh, stuff on his Facebook and all that. So, and I was, I was at a point, I was telling him, I said, look, you have not investigated this matter, but you have already taken position. You're already biased. And at a point, he said, look, we are waiting for him. Okay? So he spoke as if, you know, uh, they have already taken position. And, and, and for me, I wasn't very confident that he will be treated fairly, you know, if, he, if, if he's in his custody, without independent monitoring regarding uh, independent monitoring of the situation or conditions under which he's detained. Presumably, torture is not, not legal, right? It's just something that they would do because they can get away with it. Yeah, the thing is that, yeah, torture is not legal. But what we're saying here now is that, okay, if, if they torture him, um, they're going to, um, yeah, they should be held accountable. But in Nigeria, they, they get away with such things. And sometimes it, it gets too late. Yes, because, uh, for instance, why are, they not, why, why are they not giving him access to a lawyer? Yes, why? We are suspecting that they are torturing him and maltreating him and, uh, and may not want a lawyer to see, understand, uh, or see him under that condition. So they, are, they need to tell us, they need to come clear and clean regarding why they are holding him incommunicado, why they don't want to give him access to a lawyer. And this is a situation where the police commissioner was angry with Mubarak. Police officers have threatened Mubarak with death and all that. So how can we trust the same people treating him humanely and not torturing him. So that is the situation. Sure. Um, Leo, thank you very much. Well, and the best of luck um, and do keep us updated with uh, any further developments. It's my pleasure. As Leo Igwe mentioned, one of the ways the international community can support Mubarak Bala is by contributing to his legal defence fund. The National Secular Society has already made a £500 contribution and written to the Nigerian ambassador to the UK and the FCO to lobby for Bala's release. The NSS's chief executive, Stephen Evans, has called for more international pressure on Nigeria. Stephen has said, Mubarak Bala's arrest is an appalling and deeply concerning attack on freedom of expression, which should be condemned in the strongest terms. He's in danger for simply speaking his mind, and the UK government should join others in working to ensure he is released without delay. For further information on how you can support the campaign to free Bala, visit our website at secularism.org.uk forward slash podcast. Thanks for listening.